Good morning, everybody. I'm Michael Crawford. I'm CEO of the Soil Cooperative Research Centre, the Soil CRC. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, wherever we are in Australia or internationally, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I know that uh, online today we have uh, a very diverse audience, um, some of whom are very familiar with the work of the Soil CRC, some who don't know too much about us at all. So I'll just take a minute to introduce the Soil CRC. The Copter Research Centre for High Performance Soils is funded by the Australian Government and its 40 partners with, uh, for 10 years and we just finished the third year of the CRC, we're into the fourth year now. It's set up to undertake R&D related to soil to help give farmers the tools and knowledge they need to better manage their soils, improve their soil performance and improve their farm productivity and profitability. We have eight university partners, four state government agencies, a range of industry partners and importantly 20 farmer groups or grower groups from across Australia involved in the, the CRC. And we've been running a series of webinars to introduce you all to the various uh, projects, various activities, various um, aspects of the research being undertaken by the Soil CRC. <coughs> uh, in today's uh, talk, to be given shortly by Maran, we'll be uh, taking, Maran will speak for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll take questions in at the end to ask a question, the best way to do that is to type your question into the Q&A box. If you drop your cursor to the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, you should see a Q&A box there. Uh, and you'll type your question in there <coughs> and we'll answer them at the uh, end of the webinar. There'll also be a, um, there's a chat function where you can make other comments here in, in, in the chat. The, um, before going on to today's webinar, just an advertisement for coming webinars in uh, in two weeks time on Tuesday, the 10th of November at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time, whether that is uh, for yourselves. We'll be hearing from uh, Associate Professor David Fallopow at Charles Sturt University on building farmer innovation capability. And some of the work he, he and his colleagues have been doing with uh, farmer groups, with grower groups to help them build their innovation uh, capability within those groups and in turn with the farmers are working with uh, quite an interesting social research type project. And then on the 24th of November, we'll be hearing from Dr. Liang Wang at the University of Newcastle, Ruben Ma and Fernando Maya at the University of Tasmania on affordable rapid field-based soil tests, or what we colloquially call our lab on a chip project. So to hear about some of the advances in, in measuring soil parameters, uh, tune into that webinar. And the way you do that is to enrol, to register much the same way that you've done for today's webinar on, on our website. Today's webinar is being recorded. It will be available for downloading, for viewing afterwards and for sharing with your colleagues. Uh, to go to today's webinar, it's to be delivered by Dr. Maran Reza Rasti from Griffith University. The topic is evaluating soil function resilience to compaction and drought stresses. Marianne is a lecturer in <coughs> soil biogeochemistry chemistry at the School of Environment and Science at Griffith University. He did his PhD at Griffith under Professor Chen uh, from 2011 to 2015, and then subsequently he's been employed there first as a postdoc, postdoctoral fellow and then as a lecturer. He has extensive experience in the research of soil carbon and nutrient cycling and management, litter decomposition and nutrient dynamics, greenhouse gas emission and nutrient use efficiency and intensively managed cropping systems. So without further ado, I'll pass across to Maran and ask him to give his talk to us. Thank you, Maran. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate uh, your introduction. I'm trying to uh, share my screen. Well, so uh, hello everyone. I hope that you 
Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone, and hope you had a really nice day till now. Today, I'm going to talk about a small project uh, <clears throat> funded by Seoul CRC. It's a, a proof of concept project. So before we start, I just want to reduce a bit your expectation. It doesn't have field component. So the idea was that we try to prove the concept of changing the way that we measure soil health. And then we were expecting to expand the finding of these projects into the field trials and, <coughs> sorry, increase its capability to predict soil health and the changes in soil health by our best management practices. So, as I told you, this project funded by Salt CRC, it's a collaboration between Griffiths University, New South Wales DPI, Herbert Kane Productivity uh, Services and FACI Group. So Herbert Kane Productivity Services represent the uh, sugarcane industry and FACI Group represent the uh, uh, weed industry and uh, the arid areas of Western Australia. Just a bit of background before uh, I jump into the project. We need to have a good understanding of a healthy soil before we want to actually measure uh, soil health or improve soil health. As a definition, a healthy soil should have continued capacity to apply plants with adequate and balanced nutrients, water and air in a disease-free environment. So it's easy to say like that, but in reality, it's really difficult and complex to manage in the soil to have all physical, chemical, and biological properties in a right variation to be able to provide these capacities for a growing plant. And because of intensive agriculture system that becomes more uh, common, you know, uh, in the last hundred years, we try to increase the uh, basically yield, but we reduce the health of the soil and basically we converting a healthy soil to something that highly demand a chemical fertilizer. And basically if we remove or reduce the amount of chemical fertilizer that we use, we, we deal with a significant amount of crop yield and economical profitability. But if we keep continue doing the wrong practice, we'll end up with a really low fertility soil and significant decline in the soil health. So if I want to compare it with a human being, it seems that you get sick, you go to a doctor, they give you some medicine and serums and you feel well and you see that, okay, that's fine. Why, why should I go back to the solid food again? I stay like that forever. So I inject myself different serums and different, you know, uh, using different tablets and I can live like that forever. But the problem is if you bet, if you, basically break the balance between nutrients, the amount of carbon you have, soil chemical, and especially biological properties, then you end up with the unbalanced condition that may give you some yield benefit because you're reducing the, basically your management cost, but over a long period of time, you eventually get to a, a yield plateau, similar things that we're uh, dealing with in uh, sugarcane system in Queensland specifically, that you get to a yield plateau and you cannot increase your yield. And every year you're dealing with a decline in soil health. So we wanted to provide a simple, robust and affordable method to monitor soil health and be able to predict how different soils react to the environmental stresses and basically be able to monitor any improvement in soil health based on different management practices that we have in different cropping system. So in order to do that, we first need to know what kind of environmental stresses we're dealing with agriculture systems in Australia. We're mainly talking about drought, compaction, acidification, salinization, and carbon decline. The most important things you need to know that each of these factors can be a limiting factor that affect the whole process. If you have only one of these constraints, your soil, 
start to decline in the health condition, but usually we're dealing with a combination of these factors that coming together and make the system a bit more complex. Traditionally, we use uh, basically a suit of different physical, chemical, and biological parameters to measure soil health. For example, we measure infiltration, porosity, texture, bulk density, and so on in soil physical properties, different amount of label carbon and nitrogen, available nitrogen, the changes in pH and EC, total organic carbon, and so on in chemical properties, and also some indicators like soil respiration, enzyme activities, microbial biomass, and so on in uh, biological properties. So you can see that it's really difficult to measure all this parameter in a specific soil. It's really time consuming, it's really expensive. And also if you're looking at a long-term period, these parameters change every year. Well, at least most of them will change every year. And the thing is that some year you're coming with an improvement in physical properties, a decline in chemical properties, and an improvement in biological properties. You change your management practices everything changed. So the, the properties that going to was improving last year to start to decline. The problem is if you go and make a sing, single measurement of these properties in a field, it's difficult to interpret them. It's difficult to combine them together because each one of them has a different range and each one of them has a different acceptable level. And it's really confusing and difficult even for expert scientists to basically interpret, interpret all the results together and find out is this soil actually getting healthy or not. So this was a conversation that started with uh, Professor Chen and Professor Van Zuyten a couple of years ago. And they decided that we need to do something about it and we need to change our way that we're looking at the whole process. So instead of single measurement of soil biological and chemical properties, what about we look at the functional resilience of soil biological system in collaboration with soil physical and chemical properties when we put soil under stress and when we remove them, their stress from them. So this uh, proposal first went to the Sugar Research Australia. It was really close to be funded eventually was not successful. And when the soil CRC came and when the opportunity came, they decided that they want to put things together. Then me and Xiang Yu Liu, the PhD student of the project joined the team. And we started to wrap up things and put a proposal based on two factors of soil resistant and soil resilient. So what, is, what are these two factors? The soil resistance is the ability of a soil to maintain its functional stability after a disturbance. For example, a soil going to a drought problem or getting compacted. How well a soil can resist against the changes and keep its functional uh, capabilities intact. And the other uh, concept was soil resilient, which means that if you remove that stress, how fast the soil system can retain to its pre-disturbance level. For example, if you remove the drought or you plug the soil and basically remove the compaction, how well it can come back to its original condition. To summarize these two, I can refer you to this uh, graph in the right side. You can see that when the soil goes through uh, environmental stresses, it's lose a bit of its functionality, which is normal. But the thing is that after recovery from the stress, not all of that function will come back. So every time the soil goes through a stress, lose part of its fertility and its health condition. Similar to humans, if we get sick every, every month, a couple of times a year, eventually we become really sick. So eventually a soil will get to a point, which we call it the critical threshold, which means that it cannot recover. So we are dealing with significant land degradation in that condition. So if you're a farmer, 
if you want to know what happened to your soil, if you go through a drought period or your soil get compacted, you need to have a good understanding of the capacity of the soil to resist against the changes and recover after removal of the stress. This is critical because if you're dealing with a good year, you have enough rain, you have enough water in the system, your soil is not compacted. Using the chemical fertilizer that you normally use, you would probably get a good yield. And there is not much difference between a healthy soil and a not healthy soil in those kind of optimum years to achieve the yield. But the problem is when you dealing with a bad year, when you're dealing with a stress condition, a drought, a compaction condition, if your soil is not healthy, cannot cope with the environmental stresses, means that you get a significant drop in the yield. If it continues for a long time, you're probably dealing with bankruptcy. So we try to put everything in perspective. The, the project was based on incubation experiment. So we wanted to replicate soil compaction. We made a device to replicate soil compaction. And what we do, we compact the soil in some condition, we'll give them uh, a stress, a drought stress. Also, we had variation in the application of organic matter or not application of organic matter. And then we would measure their response through biological activities like respiration, enzyme activities, and also different processes as well. So we divide uh, for the basically rest of the experiment that I tried to explain to you, we divide it in uh, three phases. First phase is pre-stress, which they're all really similar. Mainly we don't show them in the next graphs, but the most two phases that we're going to focus on is the resistant phase. When we introduced a stress, is it a compaction or drought? And we expect to see a decline in soil functionality and soil functional properties. Here we get an optimum condition, the soil that has been on a minimum disturbance. And based on the amount of disturbance, based on the amount of stress that we apply to the soil, you can get a variation in the ratio of the decline process. Eventually when the uh, basically line get to the plateau, we know that we uh, basically the maximum stress and maximum length of stress is complete. So we go to the next phase, which is removing the stress. When we remove the stress, the soil will start to recover back, although it will not recover to its original condition, but depending on how much stress we applied in the first phase, it gets a different reaction and different recovery rate that we call it the resist, uh, resilient phase. So we measure these two phases. We measure the changes of parameter in two phases. And eventually we try to make a model to put everything together and predict soil health. So the first phase of the project was a significant literature review done by, you know, Sheng Yu. So he went to the literature, dig up everything he could to find the main indicators of soil resistance and resilience when we're dealing with compaction and drought stress and he came up with different physical, chemical and biological indicators. Yeah, we wanted to look at the drought and compaction. So basically moisture content and bulk density had to be there, but we end up to see if we're dealing with compaction and drought together, we have to move from a uh, water holding capacity to water feed pore space. So if you want more information regarding to that, I can answer the question at the end. So when you're dealing with significant, uh, basically single stresses, you better go with water holding capacity. When you mixing uh, compaction and drought, you better go with water feed for space because you get a significant overlapping. Then we uh, went to the chemical indicators like different changes in nitrogen and carbon pools, deal with mineralization, nitrification and denitrification processes and also measurement of hot water extractable organic carbon and nitrogen, which our previous experiment shows that it has a really significant uh, correlation with microbial activities. 
In terms of microbial activities, uh, biological indicators, you went a bit deeper. The fact here that you need to remember that the expensive biological indicators are just for the proof of concept. Later on, when we expand this project to the basically field trials, we don't need to go so deep in the biological indicators because if we know that they're working, if they know that they're uh, basically proving what you want to do, we can go with a simple and less expensive uh, measurement. So here we tried respiration, microbial biomass, microbial structure and diversity and enzyme activities. As you know, if you combine respiration on biomass, so you divide respiration by your microbial biomass, you end up with metabolic quotient which is really important. I don't wanna to go to details here, but it will show you that the, the carbon cycle in the system works efficiently or not. So your system using the carbon cycle to increase a microbial biomass, or if you use the carbon cycle to respire more CO2 without microbial biomass. So which means that is it wasting the food source or it's storing the food source? So, we monitored the soil functional processes and microbial community changes through their resistant and resilient phases. And eventually we try to model them together to come with a robust and affordable uh, method for measuring soil health. Let's go to the experiment that has been done. This is the first experiment done by uh, Dr. Dick uh, Rose from New South Wales DPI in collaboration with Herbert Cain uh, Productivity Services. So what I've done, they look at different uh, the conditions, three sites adjacent to each other, a forest, which is in this case, it is or indicator for a healthy condition. So it is a target. And then two sugar cane fields adjacent to the forest, one with a mixed cover cropping system or best management practices, the other one, with the fellow condition or something that we call it the conventional condition. And what he has done, he was looking at the nitrogen cycle in this system or mineralization as affected by drought. So he wanted to see if we introduce drought to these uh, uh, soils, assuming that uh, or target soil as a forest as a healthy condition and sugarcane soil as a non-healthy condition uh, in a basically conventional practice how effectively uh, soil can manage the nitrogen cycle. Is it going to produce too much nitrate, which we know that if you have a leaching in the system, you produce too much nitrate, it will leach out of the system as a leak in the nitrogen cycle. So we wanted to see how these different soils react to drought stress in terms of the nitrogen cycle. So he put them under a stress and resistance phase and he removed them from a stress on a resilient phase. And you see that at the pre-stress condition, they're pretty similar, really close to each other. But when they go through a stress, the basically sugarcane conventional system react really differently to the forest system or even mixed cropping system. And it's less resistant and less resilient to the changes. So the result of this experiment showing that the concept is working well. So we had to move to the next step. We had to bring a different soil to the lab and we wanted to introduce different levels of stress to, send, uh, stress to the soils to map their responses against uh, these environmental stresses. So we designed a lab experiment with 24 treatment using two different soil, a sandy soil and a clay soil two different moisture level, 35% uh, water food pore space, which is considered a good amount of water in the system or no drought condition, and 15% water food pore space, which represent or drought condition or low moisture condition. And then we introduce six levels of soil compaction from 0.9 gram per cubic meter up to 1.5 gram per cubic meter. And we put the soil under two uh, phases. So the first phase, as you can see here, was our uh, resistant phase. When we put a stress and we let the soil biological properties decrease, 
And then we remove the stress and release the compaction, also release the drought. So we let them to recover and want to see them how they recover. So this is the, uh, basically the result are uh, too many. I didn't want to make it too complicated. I wanted to simplify things. So here I'll show you the effect on hot water extractable organic carbon. When you're looking at <clears throat> sandy soil, you see that there's a significant difference between low compaction levels and high compaction levels when you're dealing with the low moisture content, but the effect will completely change when we go to the high moisture content. So the combination effect of uh, drought and compaction on sandy soil is different with low moisture content and high moisture content. While when you're looking at clay soil, you see that they have similar patterns. So the clay soil is not really sensitive to uh, uh, compaction as much as the sandy soil. But you see the patterns is different from low moisture content or water stress to no water stress. So you get a significant decline uh, at the end of the experiment when you're introducing more water. Similar to that, when we are looking at the enzyme activities, for example, here we have beta glucosides which is represent the carbon cycle in the system. You see that in uh, uh, sandy soil, no matter what moisture condition it is, no matter what stress, uh, uh, moisture stress it has, you see that in resistance phase, the enzyme activity declined by time in the first five week. While when you're looking at clay soil, the enzyme activities will increase when you're putting the soil under stress. So, which means that different soil type uh, react differently to uh, environmental stress as well. Similar to that, when you're looking at uh, resilient phase, you see that in both low moisture content of sandy and clay soil, you have a reduction in enzyme activities with low compaction levels. While when you're looking at high moisture content of both sandy and clay soil in a low uh, compaction rate, you get a high, a, an increase in uh, microbial activities at your uh, resilient phase. When we moving to your oral respiration process, you can see here in both low moisture condition or drought stress condition in sandy and clay soil, there's a significant difference between low compaction levels and high compaction levels. And you see that there is more respiration in high compaction condition, but in both of them, the process will reverse when you changing to no drought condition that only affected by compaction. And you see here that low compaction condition generate more CO2. So it means that the metabolic uh, reactions in the soil will change when you have a combination of drought and compaction stresses in different soil types. To put everything together, I summarize it uh, in changes of uh, microbial community structure. You see that this is an example of the clay soil that we had. We put them under stress. This is the first 30 days of compaction stress. You see there is a significant difference in microbial community con uh, microbial community structure. And also when you're comparing the carbon cycle and nitrogen cycle, for example, here respiration as a representative of carbon cycle and nitrous oxide emission as a representative of the nitrogen cycle, because you know that nitrous oxide happens in more anaerobic condition, which means that you're losing a lot of your available nitrogen in gases form, mainly in the forms of denitrogen and also as a side effect in nitrous oxide emission as well, you can see when you put soil under compaction stresses, your uh, carbon cycle start to get tighter. So you uh, produce less amount of CO2 respiration as a separation of aerobic microbial uh, basically community. Why? Because anaerobic microbial community start to boost, you get a significant a problem with your nitrogen cycle and losing of nitrogen and nitrous oxide significant increase. 
While when you're looking at the no stress condition, you have more microbial activity in aerobic condition. So which means that you have more respiration coming from the system while your uh, nitrogen cycle is really tight and you don't lose nitrogen uh, based on gas emission. At the same time, when you have high concentration of nitrous oxide, which means that you have a really high concentration of nitrate available because nitrate is the fuel for nitrous oxide emission. And if you're looking at the leaching problem, you will have a significant amount of leaching when you leaching of nitrogen when you're looking at compaction condition. So we moved on to the next experiment. We used two different uh, soil, two different, basically two different sandy soil, one under conventional, one under best management practices from Western Australia to look at uh, drought stress. We used three levels of moisture condition from uh, no moisture stress to uh, moderate moisture stress to significant moderate moisture stress and also introduced uh, control condition and application of organic matter, which was the local residues available in the area. When we look at the result, you see uh, both uh, conventional and best management practices in terms of their microbial activity didn't change that much in a resistant phase when they've been dealing with uh, a significant amount of stress. While when we applied organic matter, we see significant increase in microbial activity. The problem we have here is that the, the application of fresh organic matter may mask or may cover the effect that we get from the stress. So that's why when we comparing the result, we need to be mindful to separately looking at the result. That's why when we're looking at the respiration, we separate the result. You see here, when you don't apply organic matter, there's a significant difference between your conventional uh, practices as you see in red and the best management practices that you see in blue color. So in this case, conventional uh, practices produce less emission. As you can see, the most amount of emission you get, it will be your best management practices under no stress or no drought condition. While the system will change when you apply organic matter. So when you apply organic matter, it masks the effect of drought. So <clears throat> you see here, the amount of respiration you get in a significant drought condition will be really close into best management and conventional practices while they will be significantly different from no drought conditions. I don't know how much time you have, I need to rush. So move to the next experiment we have done the compaction on a clay soil. So we take two uh, soils adjusting to each other, one best management, one conventional management, two different compaction level application of organic matter and surface application of organic matter versus plugging or mixture. Iran, no more than five minutes. No more than five, five minutes. minutes, I'm done, almost done. Okay. So. Similar pattern, when you don't uh, apply organic matter, you don't get significant change in microbial activities while applying organic matter significantly change the application of uh, significant change the soil biological systems with more uh, resilience in best management practices compared to the conventional management. This is obvious in the respiration that we see as well there is a significant difference between conventional management and best management practices. Just remember that this soil has been taken from two adjacent farm uh, close to each other. So basically they're the same in terms of their uh, soil characteristics. So the only difference between them is in their management practice that have been differently. And you see here, there's a significant difference between the management practices while we're not applying organic matter, but while we apply organic matter, the system will be completely changed. So the risk here is that when you apply organic matter, if you apply too much, similar to a person that has been dieting for 72 hours and then you give him five pizzas. So he cannot effectively use that organic matter to improve uh, its health. So basically most of this organic matter goes to waste. So what is the future? 
we know that the system works. We know that the, the basically the process is working. So we need to take it to the field and we need to introduce the yield result into the system as well. So basically here we didn't have any plant growing. So we need to start growing plants. We need to start to introduce the yield to the process. And then we have a combination of management practices such as cropping, uh, crop cover cropping or something like that and application of organic matter as well as the effect of the amount that we get from yield into the system. If we achieve to do that, the whole idea is that instead of a generic uh, old fashioned um, uh, grading of soil health, which basically, for example, you need a lot of data from US and Australia to put together, find the range. And basically according to that, you can guess what, uh, what is the health status of your cell and how it's gonna be resilient to changes. You can have a target improvement in the productivity and profitability of your specific land because you're going to make a soil health matrix based on your specific soil type and a specific field. And you're going to be able to uh, monitor your soil health year by year in your specific land and see how it's going to improve. So usually when I get to this point, people tell me, so what? You measured a lot of different things. You talk about a lot of different processes. How does it uh, goes back? to reality and how, how does it goes back to something tangible that we can see. So this is so what uh, a slide. So I modeled the result from the combined compaction and drought stress in a sandy soil in the left and a clay soil on the right. So both of these soils has been under compaction and drought stresses over here you don't have drought stress, you're only dealing with compaction. Here you have a combination of drought and compaction stress, similar here, no drought, but compaction, combination of drought and compaction. So when you looking at a specific soil and when you have a target, so for example, you're targeting a healthy soil. In this condition, my healthy soil, my target is the soil under no drought and no compaction. Yeah, if I put it as a target, then I can see the differences of my compaction levels and my drought and see how it affects my soil to get far away from optimum condition. So when I'm looking at uh, sandy soil, I can see that it's more affected by compaction, compaction stress than drought. So a significant amount of changes and getting far away from optimum condition when it goes through compaction comparing to when it's go through drought. So for example, here, you see that no compaction condition in uh, high moisture and low moisture content, really close to each other. But while the compaction kicked in, this gets far away from optimum condition. This is different when you're looking at a clay soil. In a clay soil, you see that it's get more affected by drought stress than compaction stress. So when you put the drought stress into your soil system, they get more away from optimum condition comparing that when you have a combination of drought and compaction. So this is the takeaway message. We can make these maps, we can basically make these models based on each individual farming system, based on each individual land. And then after that, we can year by year monitor the improvement in your soil health and to see how for example, if this is this year now, next year, the year after, the year after, how it can get close to optimum condition. And that's it from me. Hope that you're still awake, hasn't asleep, and I'm happy to answer any question. Let me stop sharing, and it's back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Mara, and for the comprehensive presentation, and uh... I like some of your analogies. I'm not quite sure about the five pizzas after 72 hours, but um, <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about. So if we go to the questions um, in the Q&A box, we've got a couple of questions there now. And um, whilst we're working through these ones, it'll give other people the chance to uh, type questions 
into the um, Q and A box. So the first one, Marianne, is from Nalanta. Um, it is not clear to me how your methodology is applicable to soils with strong shrink swell characteristics such as vertisols, where soil fall structure is a function of soil water content. Could you please clarify? Yeah, so the difference of this process with every other process is that you need to uh, target your optimum condition. When you have a shrinking and swelling soil, you cannot compare that soil with this uh, other soil that doesn't have this problem. So your optimum condition will change. So in each soil, you get an optimum condition based on the uh, initial characteristic that it has. And then you map up the, the, uh, the soil's resistance and resilience based on environmental stresses that introduce to that condition. So I'm not saying that if I improve the soil health in a shrinking and swelling soil, it will be better than a soil that doesn't have this problem, but I'm saying that it gets closer to its own optimum condition and we can monitor it because we're targeting its optimum condition as the target and we're trying to achieve to that. All right, thank you, Maren. But the next one is from uh, Jahangir. Hi, Maren, thanks for a nice presentation. Did you try with cover crops or mulching to minimize drought? Yeah, so the, the, uh, the drought stress that we had, so remember that this was all uh, incubation trial, we didn't get to the field. So what we have done when we introducing the crop residues, we did two different methods. The first method we, we use uh, uh, cover cropping in no tillage system. And then the other way we incorporated the plant residues and you see a significant difference because when you uh, cover cropping, the, uh, when you put the residues on the top, you get a significant amount of respiration and your microbial activity will be completely different. So we look at these two different conditions separately. Oh, thank you. Lucas has uh, asked, uh, the tests look complex and expensive. Do you think there will be a simple way to assess resilience in the future? Uh, actually, I should not say that, but it is. It is complex and it is expensive. And Professor Chen was generous to donate around, I can say $100,000 to the project to make it happen. The thing was that when we wanted to prove the concept, we have to go full strength in to make sure the concept works but the thing is that when you're looking at a lab incubation experiment, your result has to be bang on, you know, has to be on a point. But when you go to the field, your result doesn't need to be that accurate. So you're looking at a general improvement in soil health condition. So that's the difference. When we're looking at incubation experiment and a proof of concept, we're looking at each uh, single uh, changes and we need to be so specific. That's why we tackle it from every angle that we can but most of these parameters are not necessary to get a significant amount of a, a good improvement. So when we go to the field condition, we're going to reduce the number of factors we're looking at, but we're looking at a relatively a good result, does as, not as accurate as a lab experiment, but it will be fairly accurate in the in, in basically field. All right, thank you. From Nancy, so great presentation. Nitrous oxide arises from soils primarily via the two biological pathways of nitrification and denitrification. Uh, he then talks about the very yeah, question. Yeah, so the question is what the question is, what is the major process of nitrous oxide emission in your stress experiment? Oh, okay. So Nanti is uh, hitting the point. So that's why uh, when, I, when I was looking at the combined application of uh, stress and drought, I use water field porous space instead of uh, water holding capacity. That's why when we're looking at nitrification and denitrification process, it's really important to see how much of your project is filled with water. And that will give you the, the, the dominance uh, factor, the dominance process of nitrification or denitrification. So imagine if you have a soil with lower moisture content, which is packed too much, which means that most of its prosody will be filled with water with a less amount of water. So you get a higher water feed for a space, although it has low moisture because it's compacted too much. Or if you have higher moisture content in a soil because you had low compaction, less amount of your prosody will fill with water while you have more water in the system, but because it's not compacted, it's not filling the 
the whole porosity. So we try to make a balance between the amount of porosity that filled with water and related that to, to the nitrification and denitrification process. And that's why when I'm looking at the increase in denitrification, I can say by confidence it's coming, uh, uh, when I'm looking at the amount of nitrous oxide, I can say by confidence that it's coming from denitrification process because either my soil it has less amount of water, but it's too compacted, it becomes so anaerobic condition, or it is less compacted, but more amount of water, it goes to anaerobic condition as well. So both of these processes will uh, shift my system to anaerobic condition, and that will uh, result in a higher amount of nitrous oxide emission. All right, thank you, Marianne. Uh, we're up to the last question, but unless there's a one last a quick typer, um, because we're about to finish up on time. Yeah. From Jahangir, did you think about the addition of biochar or how would biochar affect these results? Yeah, so the biochar, I love biochar. I have too many publications on biochar, but the problem with biochar is that if you apply biochar in the system, you cannot take it back. So biochar is staying in the system for a hundred years. So you need to make sure when you apply biochar to agriculture system, you, uh, you're applying for a, a multiple, you know, uh, benefits, not only uh, one benefit in the system. So we definitely in the next step, we're going to apply biochar in the system, but we start with the most common, you know, uh, management practice, which is cover cropping and using the residues uh, in a fellow period and residues in the last year crop, which is really cheap because at the moment the biochar process is a bit expensive, but yeah, we love to do that and definitely we'll try it in future. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. We'll, um, we'll finish up there. So thank you very much for, to, to Dr. Marianne Rezo Rushdi from Griffith University for that presentation. It will be available on our website at www.sourcehrc.com.au in a couple of days time for you to, uh, to view again or to pass on to your colleagues. Uh, if you're not already doing so, follow us on Twitter, if that's your go, or connect with us on LinkedIn or look at our um, videos and, and past our webinars through the Source RC YouTube video. Uh, thank you everyone for your, your time and attention, and I look forward to seeing many of you in two weeks time for our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Have a really nice day.